So this is uh, the panel on Murray's future. So it's true just to disclose, so none of us has met Murray Rothbard, but I would say of these three panels, we're the best looking Rothbardians. So that's, I will say that. Um, so we're just gonna, we'll do the same thing they did on the other one. So we'll limit it to, to like five minutes each. We'll just go through and just, you know, give our personal history of the Mises Institute, uh, the, work, the way that Murray Rothbard's influenced us, and then whatever is left of the balance will uh, field your questions. So you wanna start? Yeah, so I'm Anton Chamberlain. I'm a economics student at Lowell University in New Orleans where I studied Walter Block. Um, as you said, no, I never met Murray Rothbard. I was negative two when he died. Um, <laughs> it was, so through Ron Paul and YouTube is how I came into the movement. And one of the first books I remember reading was Rothbard's For a New Liberty. And I just remember every page was something that it was just brand new, an idea I'd never heard of, and it was just revolutionary. I remember I was sitting and waiting to take, I think, either my license or my permit test. I'm just sitting there reading For a New Liberty. And later on, junior year of high school, I read Anatomy of the State, and that firmly confirmed my anarcho-capitalism. So you know, if it wasn't for Rothbard and the Mises Institute, I certainly wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be at Lola, and I wouldn't be an anarcho-capitalist. Um, the Mises Institute and what Rothbard has been able to do is I think that it's Austrian economics, I think is such an important thing that a lot of people need to know. but. Uh, the Mises Institute get, gets it to where we can know about it, you know, especially with the Internet age, what the Mises Institute has been able to do and what Rothbard was able to get going when he started the Institute in 1982 was kind of create this ability for people to learn about economics and what uh, Rothbard was able to do along the Mises Institute. You know, there's no Keynes University, Keynesian University summer program that gets, you know, a couple hundred thousand, or not hundred thousand, but a couple hundred applicants. Um, but so Rothbard is very much the reason why I'm on the career path that I'm on to be an econ professor is the reason why I'm here, is the reason why I've you know, attended Mises University. If it wasn't for Rothbard, my, I'd probably be a music composition major at the University of Georgia right now if it wasn't for Murray Rothbard. So the influence that Rothbard had on my life was tremendous. Um, hello, I'm Marta Hidalgo. I come from Spain. And what I, what I like most about Murray Rothbard is his positivity. Like, I've read um, Anatomy of the State and what has government done to our money. And for me, they're like horror stories. It's worse, worse than reading Stephen King. But even though, <laughs> even when I finish reading that, it's, he's like so positive and it makes, it, it makes so much sense to, to defend liberty and to fight for it. That I, it's one of the things I love the most about him. And even though I disagree with him, I come from Spain. I've read Nations by Consent by consent five times this week. I think, I think that I could convince him about my ideas too, and he challenges me to think differently about what I already think. So that's what I like the, like the most about him. Hi everyone, my name's Ziad Burkett. I am also a multi Mises U alum, more than most people to show you my addiction to the place. Um, I, I came to the Mises Institute in libertarianism and uh, Austrian economics pretty normally, like I, someone recommended Ron Paul, um, and from there, there was a footnote from a pretty interesting title called What Has Government Done to Our Money? So pretty early on, I went from as apolitical as they come to Rothbard in about two weeks. Uh, so that was really nice. And it's, I just love reading him because of, I forgot who the speaker was earlier, but mentioned not only his clarity, but his depth. And it's really nice to have both. And I've been, uh, I, just, I constantly like will read lots of topics. And then I'll go back and read something from Rothbard, and all, every time I'm like, why do I even read anything else? Like, I should just, just stick with the man for now. Um, but it's really nice because of the breadth of the topics he's talked about. I, basically, whenever I have conversations with people, because I like to debate, and you know, just like every libertarian does, uh, and try to convince as many people as possible, you know, do our part, the whole convince three people, and if everyone can do that in like 10 years, we'll have an anarcho-capitalist world. So I'm trying to knock out my three per year. And... Uh, whenever there's like a topic that, you know, there's always people with uh, different perspectives and they, they challenge you. And almost my go-to is just to like type in the topic and then finish the Google search with Murray Rothbard. And then I find something on there. And it's, it's usually a good starting point and there's usually something about it. And I've come to realize over time that I, I, I do agree with him disengaging with, uh, with academia at some point because I, I've learned in my debates, so to speak, with people that uh, nobody really disagrees with the non-aggression principle. Like, wh who's going to disagree with don't hurt people and don't take their stuff? Nobody. But people make exceptions to those rules. Uh, and it really c just comes down to, like, proper understanding of economics. And that's why I love reading Rothbard of, because of how good he is on economics. And then you can, 
you know, translate that to the layman and, and hopefully spark their interest. And, and I think he just does such a good job on that. The, the one thing, though, despite all of that, what I like most about Rothbard is his foresight. I think his ability to foresee problems early, like I, I love academia and I love, you know, intellectuals and stuff like that, but the theory is fascinating, but everybody, like a lot of people are good on theory. Practicality is something that uh, I think very few people are very good at, and Rothbard had the incredible ability to be really good at both. Um, I'm a big fan of Jeff Dice for his, you know, strategic intelligence and his practicality. Uh, and, and just Rothbard's ability to understand risk of, of trying new strategies uh, and foreseeing different problems. I recently read his article, Big Government Libertarians, and it, I mean, Bob could have wrote it last week. It was like that spot on of just understanding, you know, risks of being different ways and, and his foresight uh, to understand risk and, and what to do, you know, his uh, what should we do article is, is awesome. And, and that, despite all the other things, that's probably my favorite thing about Rothbard. I guess when you say people who would disagree with not hurting people and breaking their stuff, he, he doesn't know about Antifa, but uh, I'm not going to be the one to tell him to let him down. I'm talking about Stephen King. Um, okay, so just so you know, I told Ed he's allowed to go a little longer too because these guys went shorter than the five, so we're not cheating, it's just we have tradable permits up here for total minutes, okay? Um, so yeah, let me... Uh, so let me say, you know, the, the Mises Institute, for people who didn't realize like we're doing a tribute to Murray Rothbard for this particular anniversary. This is the Mises Institute anniversary. Um, and I, I should just say, obviously, I would not be here if it weren't for the Mises Institute. Um, it's Murray Rothbard, just hands down, is the person that most influenced, you know, who I became. So in terms of, I suppose, you know, economic theory, you could argue that, you know, what Mises did in human action in terms of developing stuff you know, it was the the development of things in terms of like which economist did I learn the most from in terms of the stuff that he invented. But clearly, in terms of well, like, who do I model? When, you know, my career it's it's Murray Rothbard. It's such that I think people take it for granted, and I I try to tell people this when they get frustrated with Rothbardians who get so upset about. I cannot believe these other libertarians who go out of their way to denigrate Rothbard, like they're too cool for him, and you know, oh, he's so you know eighth grade, and you know they've moved on, and yeah, that is annoying, and don't get me wrong, but I think part of it is kind of like when someone says like, oh, the Beatles are terrible, and it's you know they're saying that because so many people, you know, they're so awesome, they're such the standard bearer, and so I think that's with Rothbard. I mean, just to give you, well, like he was saying anything in Austro libertarianism that you want to talk about or write on. You know, the baseline, the default is go figure out what did Rothbard say on that, and that's the starting point. Like, that's the definitive standard thing. And maybe you disagree with it, maybe you don't, right? So, just for those who listen to Contra Krugman, the uh, last two weeks ago, or last week, I'm getting mixed up now, they, Krugman was talking about marginal productivity theory and saying, ah, free market economists all agree that workers get paid their marginal product, but that means that, you know, uh, therefore we don't care if rich people work more. And so Tom and I went through that, and I had some people, Gene Epstein was here, and, and he was saying, no, you conceded too much, you know, even on the, on the margin there, it's, there's not the equality there, that every transaction, and so I was saying, yeah, but does that mean workers don't get paid their marginal product? Because I thought we'd like to say that. So, you know, I need to go look at man, economy, and state and see exactly what did Rothbard say on that point. I mean, so that's just one example of how whenever there's some, you know, fine point of dispute, like, wait, we got this one principle, but this one... Is there a contradiction? You just, what did Rothbard say? And that's, the, it doesn't mean you're gonna agree with him, but that's the, the starting point. Um, it's, and again, we take it for granted that uh, just what a clear writer Rothbard is, right? When, you, when he says, the state is a gang of thieves writ large, you're not like, what did he mean by that? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know exactly what he's talking about, right? Whereas you could read, you know, some essay from Hayek and you could love it, and by the end of it, you say, what did he say? You're just gonna have to read it yourself. Let me, you know, and it's again, it's not criticism. It's just the, the style. It's it's just a different sort of thing that Rothbard. He has a very clearly defined point. And as people say, it's. Let me give you another example, just to show. It's hilarious the way his critics will attack him, just to show his his strength and his you know how amazing he is as a thinker. I've seen people as this floats around. They say stuff like, you know, the thing with Murray Rothbard is. You know, if you go ask a professional historian, what do you think about Rothbard's contributions to history? He'll say, oh, they're mediocre. If you go ask a professional philosopher, what do you think about Rothbard's contributions to philosophy? And they'll list five different disciplines that Rothbard had original, you know, papers criticizing what the mainstream paradigm was in that area. And they're just dismissing him as, yeah, but if you ask the people. So 
you know, say, okay, suppose he really were a genius that was making, you know, pathbreaking contributions in those five areas. Isn't this exactly what the world would look like? It's not like the leaders in those fields that Rothbard's saying are making some mistake at step two would say, oh my gosh, he's right, my career's in shambles now, and they'd say to MIT, take away my tenure. No, they would say, this guy's some, but he doesn't even believe in the Fed. What a moron, you right? So I'm just saying that, the, and it's ironic because it comes from people who agree, oh yes, we Austrians who also are denigrated in our little area, you know, the, the people at MIT think we're cranks also. They think we're like creationists in terms of like the way, by, but we're right in our little area. It's just Rothbard's wrong when he, you know, delves outside it. So I'm just saying it's, it's funny how they use the argument from authority to blow him up in these other areas. So again, say what you will, but just the fact that he does have all of these things where he would just dabble in an area, like history of economic thought, just to give an example, you know, I was doing that for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom, and again, just the standard, you know, go, you know, there's the Shump at Air, and there's, there's standard references, blog, and so forth, but again, Rothbard has a whole thing there, and you go in, and he just digs up stuff that nobody else talks about, and Rothbard, in a little footnote, and you realize, like, before Rothbard wrote this thing on John Stuart Mill, like, he just read 10 books, you know, so it's, it's amazing, this, this sort of just knowledge he had on how he connects things together. Okay, let me just spend a few minutes here talking about, oh, one thing, about him being like a real person. Um, so my favorite thing to do besides economics is to troll libertarians on Facebook. And so <laughs> I totally understand, I get the, uh, by the way, just, you know, I made the joke about how photogenic this group is. A lot of my jokes have withered away over the years because I used to make fun of our events as like Star Trek conventions and now it's not really, it doesn't really work as much anymore. <laughs> but, so now I make fun of them for having foreign accents. That's all I got. But. <laughs> The, what um, Rothbard was like that I was on a road trip my mom it was like I was in high school or something we were going on some you know family vacation and my mom's friend was with us in the car like the two families were going and this the the way you switch it up at the, at the rest stops and whatever so we're in there and I had making economic sense the the collection of Rothbard's essays and I was reading that in the back and you know I don't want anyone else to see it because I don't want to know what a nerd I am and I'm reading this, this is my special little thing and um, somebody talks about oh, I was reading about sports yeah yeah but this <laughs> And so my mom's friend, who was not, to my knowledge, you know, political or ideological, she's like, what do you read? I'm bored, Bob. What, what is that? And I had put it aside because I, I got car sick, you know, you're in the back. And I, I was like, oh, nothing, nothing. She goes, oh, what is it? And I was afraid she was going to think, this guy's crazy. So she starts reading it. And, and he was writing about how they don't build houses like that anymore. And then Roth was explaining the regulations. And, so, and she was like, oh, is that why? Because I've noticed they don't build houses like that anymore. <laughs> And I was amazed that, you know, oh my, I was like embarrassed about my little, you know, nerdy little passion. And the, the, my mom's friend was reading him and just totally got into it and was learning stuff about why the economy works the way it does. So, again, like you, you can hand it to your mom's friend. All right. I'll just put it that way. Uh, let me just I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up here and, and turn over to Ed. But let me just make a few points, examples. People are, you know, they want to show he's accessible and keep this stuff light. But I don't want somebody who's not familiar with his work to come away from this thinking okay, right, Rothbard was real ideological and he was, you know, witty guy or whatever, but come on, he wasn't a technical. And also there's this um, stereotype that, oh, the reason somebody would go into Austrian economics is because they're not good at calculus, right? That sort of thing. <laughs> and so, it, now it's true, if you weren't good at calculus and liked economics, you would have to go into Austrian economics. <laughs> but it does not mean, okay, you guys get how that works. So, I mean, Rothbard was studying statistics and then, you know, had an epiphany and, and walked out and, and then, you know, realized Austrian economics was correct. And, I mean, he's got some very technical papers, so people don't know this. I would advise you, if you're getting like a PhD in economics, you know, go ahead and learn your coursework, standard utility theory, price theory, things like that, and go look at Rothbard's essay on a reconstruction of utility and welfare economics, and you'll see he gets into stuff in that essay that he doesn't get into in Man, Economy, and State. I guess that's my point, that you, he shows a knowledge of like the, the cutting edge in terms of expected utility theory and things like that in that essay that doesn't, you know, he just decided not to put in man economy and state, I guess, because of the, the level of sophistication. Um, he, he wrote on chaos theory, the, you know, the mathematical discipline, and just showed how that was destroying standard mainstream economics from within, like in mainstream economics, like econometrics, they'll have error terms that are normally distributed and blah, 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 and Roper was showing how, no, the people in this, this cutting edge field of chaos theory are undercutting those foundations. Um, one last thing, I, if I had a whiteboard or something, let me, we'll try this. Okay, so, do you guys remember when you learned about monopolistic competition? We all remember that, right? <laughs> it was right after the keg stands? Okay, so, <laughs> this is the last thing, let me, just, you gotta picture this. Okay, so in a normal textbook, they're explaining what's the problem with firms that are 
um, they can control their price of their product. And so there's a downward sloping demand curve. So it looks like this. And so if the cost curve is nice and smooth, where that thing is tangent, it has to be at a point not at the lowest point of the U, right? So here's the U, and there's a line like that, and where it's tangent cannot possibly be at the lowest point, right? So mainstream economics textbooks say that's the problem with a, an industry that's monopolistically competitive is because in the equilibrium zero profit point where the you know demand curve hits the average total cost curve, so there's zero profit, it's at a higher than minimum average cost, right? And so they, they say, oh, that's excess capacity. It's like Nike and Reebok. They have all these factories, and they could crank out more shoes, but they don't. And, they have that, and it's just wasteful. And, and so... Rothbard in Man Economy State goes through and blows that up. He's like, this is crazy. So like for the next 30 years, Nike and Reebok, they're, fact you know, they're replacing pieces in their factory and always have more capacity than they know they're going to need. Why would they do that? That's stupid. Okay, so you, you know he must be right, but then he points out the reason that happens, that's a geometric thing. That's nothing to do with economics. It's because they assu assume the cost curve is a smooth U. If it's jagged, so he draws it like like that, and then he has a downward sloping thing that cuts it at its, its lowest point. So he said, this is nothing about economics, it's just the fact that they drew a, a smooth curve. Okay, that is a brilliant point. Who else would have thought of that, right? And so, uh, I hope you guys got it. You know, I was expecting <laughs> you'd all be storming the barricades at this point, but I was saying little things like that. So people, well, that's another Chris, we say, oh, he didn't do anything in man economy and state, he just you know, synthesized it. As Joe said, no, he extended production theory. He did a lot of little things like that where he was like moving the ball forward a few yards on these things, taking it beyond. So yeah, he didn't just do the whole thing from scratch, but whereas like monopoly theory there, he really did do a lot from scratch. But I'm saying little things like that where yeah, a free market economists knew there was something screwy with that thing you learn in the textbook. But to my knowledge, you know, that insight about that thing, which has been a geometric assumption and had nothing to do with economics, I think that was just, you know, one example among many of the stuff he did there. Okay. All right, Bob, thanks so much. I appreciate all of the uh, extra time that you've yeah. given me. <laughs> I yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from New York. <laughs> Are you going to do a reading? <laughs> Chapter one. <laughs> it's the year. <laughs> I do uh, really want to uh, thank uh, the Mises Institute for making this possible, and I want to thank my professor, Walter Block, for changing my life. And uh, <laughs> so I'm 42, and when I was. Okay. <laughs> we weren't prepared for that. We're not wearing pants. <laughs> when I was a kid, I was uh, asking my college classmates whether I should take Professor Walter Block's class. And one of my, cl I said, is he good? And one of my classmates, she said, yeah, he's good. Um, I think you'll like him if you're a libertarian. And I said to myself, yeah, I think I'm a libertarian. And so that was really the extent of my, you know, depth as a young, you know, young college kid. And then when I had his class, I thought, wow, this is really, really amazing. And I went from being someone who really didn't care about school in high school to actually someone who became obsessed with uh, reading and then eventually writing. I chatted with Walter Block uh, when I was about 20 years old or 21 years old, and he said, okay, here are the, it's summer vacations coming up, here are the 16 books that you're gonna read over the summer. And I was like, but it's the summer vacation, and I don't think I've read 16 books in my life. Um, <laughs> But what Walter did is he said to me, he said, you know, I'm actually really jealous of you right now. And I said, why? And he said, because you're going to get, and so the, the list of books included things like uh, For a New Liberty, Ethics of Liberty, a bunch of other books, including uh, Nozick, uh, Osterfeld, a lot of other uh, libertarian writers. And Walter said, I'm so jealous of you because you're going to get to read these books for the first time. 
and it really was fascinating. I just remember sitting outside in the backyard of my parents' house and just going through all these books, and this was just really fantastic. It was that same summer when I attended the Mises Institute, uh, Mises University, so I would have been 21 at that time. So it's been now half of my life that I've been connected with these ideas. And at that time, I just got so interested in the ideas of all these thinkers, but specifically Murray Rothbard was my favorite. And that really encouraged me to go to graduate school. And I had a great time in graduate school at George Mason. And I was really just pushing this, you know, hardcore libertarianism. I wrote my dissertation on uh, examples of private rule enforcement with an emphasis on financial markets. And a lot of my uh, classmates would say, ah, no, don't do that. You gotta water down your work and you'll never get a job. Well, it turns out I ended up getting uh, 23 job interviews, which was the record for George Mason University at the time. I ended up getting some decent jobs. And over the years, um, I've had a fairly nice career. So they talk about Murray Rothbard, living in poverty, and I feel bad for him, but I'm not living in poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teaching at Trinity College now, and the influence of Rothbard is much vast, more vast than I would have even predicted. So once we were just talking about some, some, some idea in class, I forget, um, and out of the blue, some kid said, said to someone else, he said, that sounds like Murray Rothbard. So this guy who was just some random kid I didn't know, I had never assigned him that uh, economist before, but he just happened to know about it. I had another student, uh, the, another semester, he said, do you mind if I write my paper on privatizing national defense? I said, <laughs> by all means. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think that uh, the influence that he's had now is probably much greater than uh, he would have predicted. I'm visiting different countries, traveling around the world, and seeing people, and just seeing so many young people. I wrote, uh, uh, edited a book called Anarchy and the Law, and I wrote the best book in the world <laughs> called Private <laughs> Governance. And it's about private rules and regulations. I was alternative to government rules and regulations. And I was in, once in the Czech Republic, and one of these students there was like, why are you being so moderate? And I'm like, this is good. This is the world that I want to live in. So thank you. Is it preferable for the people in the back if I stand? Yes. OK. <laughs> the people have spoken. Um, I'm Ashton Fair, and I. Uh, mentioned last night I graduated from Mises U this year. Um, an awesome experience, just such a privilege. If you haven't had the chance to do that and you have the opportunity, do it. Like, do yourself a favor. Um, I actually grew up in, an, in a household that was incredibly imbued with these libertarian principles. I had um, a father and a grandfather who regularly read the Freeman and just had you know, fests raging about it at dinner at night where they'd talk about the Federal Reserve and how we need to take it down. And this was like regular conversation in my childhood home. <laughs> and my mom would leave the in-laws at dinner and say, oh my gosh, we need to like unsubscribe to this secretly because your dad's just crazy about it. And these, these are just regular topics of conversation, not just once in a while, but pretty much at every dinner that we had, at every family event, this is what was discussed. Um, I grew up, my dad gave me my first Ron Paul book when I was about 14 or 15, and had, us, had me and my sisters all read it, and it was, it was amazing, and I was just soaking up these ideas. I don't think that my parents knew at the time they were creating a monster, but it was happening. <laughs> um, and, and I'm so blessed that it did. So I grew up reading Ron Paul, and I grew up following all of these key ideas and these key figures, but I didn't meet Rothbard as Rothbard through his writings until this year. And it has been the coolest experience to see how he has formulated so much of my life, how he's laid this groundwork 
without me even recognizing it, that it was him. And it makes me wonder how many other people are going through the same thing. How, how many people know Rothbard, but they've never been formally introduced. Um, so a few things that I've learned this year as I've been thinking about Rothbard and reading more of his works and actually specifically diving into his writings, um, I've, I've been applying a lot of it to the ideas of entrepreneurism, because that's another big thing going on in my life right now um, and my husband's life. And there are a few key things that Rothbard is just incredible at. He, there are so many parallels between he and the perfect entrepreneur and so many examples he sets. Um, one of them is that he was the most principled man. He had his own principles that he established from the ground up, kind of from you know, just the atom of a thought, and he would evolve and develop this whole idea, and he formulated his own system of principles. Um, and then he combined those principles with a mission, with a life mission, and created a movement. That's something that every entrepreneur wants to do, right? You want to create a movement. You don't want to create a product. You don't want to create just like a service. You want this movement. And without these principles, like Murray Rothbard had, no entrepreneur can succeed. So that example has been really incredible for me to watch. Um, another is that he was so good at being extremely specific in spotting wrongs, wrong ideas, wrong actions on behalf of government or individuals, um, anything where the, the principle had been violated. He, was so, he had such a firm basis of principles that he recognized it immediately when something deterred from that foundation. Um, and he adamantly, boldly pursued <laughs> whatever it was that had been wrong, whether it was something in the NFL or if it was a bad movie review or if it was you know, some, <laughs> something about business cycles. He would identify exactly where that train of thought went wrong and correct it. And much like an entrepreneur today who wants to pursue you know, a, a fallacy in a product or a weakness in the market or a lack of a service that exists and then pursue and fill in that with something, you know, that provides value, that brings some kind of greatness to, to uh, an area that's really missing it. Um, there's, there's another thing that I think is the most important thing that Mary, Murray teaches. And he did this mainly just through his example, but while he had this massive mission and these incredible principles that he shared with the world that we've all read about, that we all are here to appreciate right now, he was, he was great, but in all of his greatness, he was just a good person. Um, libertarianism wasn't his life. He, he encourages you know, the pursuit of your interests and of your, your unique abilities, doing what you love and what you're passionate about and bringing the full force of your principles to any of those areas that you excel in or that you love. And that has been an incredible, um, an incredible inspiration to me because we're talking about Murray's future, right? And so I think being able to take these ideas and that example and take that forward into the future, think about where can we refine our own principles? Where are we lacking? Where are we in these gray areas? And how can I you know, project this into everything I do? Um, so I think only by following this exact method that Mary was so known for and so excelled at can we create a life full of substance and fulfillment and a guaranteed impact? So that's, that's my two cents on Murray. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I guess I've been asked to stand. I don't know if, uh, how much I need to speak into the microphone. Uh, uh, someone, all right. Um, <laughs> I have a tendency, okay. Um, so I want to thank the Mises Institute for asking me to talk about my personal experiences, uh, at least my, how Murray Rothbard has influenced my life. Uh, there's probably two individuals who have influenced me the most, and it's either been my father or Murray Rothbard, just in terms of you know how much they've shaped my general structure of things. Murray Rothbard in particular, uh, how he wrote, his clarity, his wit, and just the way he was sort of a, a systematic uh, builder, you know, a, a great phrase that he would always use to describe other writers, he never described himself with this, is the phrase of architectonic edifice. So he wrote a review of uh, Bomberwerk's Capital and Interest one time, and he, he called it an architectonic edifice. And I view that, you know, in a sense, that's how Murray Rothbard's work is. It's an architectonic edifice. The other word he loved to use was scintillating. 
and I like using that word as well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was one times criticized by, for using scintillating in an essay. Oh, you know, you, you described this quote as scintillating, and I said, how is it not scintillating? It's brilliant. And, you know, it was, it was basically a Rothbard quote, and I, uh, I heavily uh, in, enjoyed using that, uh, using that word. Uh, the first book I ever read involved in this in the fall of 2008, uh, Ron Paul's The Revolution. The second book I read was Murray Rothbard's What Has Government Done to Our Money? And the rest, you could say, is history. Uh, a couple months later, I read America's Great Depression. I started reading Man, Economy, and State. This is all my high school, uh, my senior year of high school. And I was, I was, you could say, vocal with my economics views. I was sort of known as that guy in high school. Uh, at that time, I thought that guy, that, I meant I was, I was the cool guy. However, as time went on, I was sort of revised uh, my, uh, sort of my own uh, subjective opinion of, I guess, or how other people were viewing me. Um, Anyway, so I, in the summer of 2011, I worked at a warehouse basically packaging boxes uh, and, and, and stacking boxes, et cetera, and moving trucks. And one of the things I was allowed to do is uh, you could listen to audio while you're doing this. I mean, lifting 60-pound boxes all the time, it's, it's not the most fun in the world. Uh, so most people, they listen to music. I listen to Mario Rothbard's lectures on the progressive era. Because uh, you know why you know why not? Uh, it's good, 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 good to uh, good to go through the day. And uh, so that was in the summer of 2011. I remember listening to these lectures. And said, "Wow, you know these are so great. I, I wish he wrote a book on this." <laughs> and I'm very happy to say that six years later, well, he did write a book on this. You could say at least that you know it's being uh, you know, it's being published now by the Mises Institute. I'm very fortunate to have been uh, the editor of that. Um, I was asked to put a place, so this isn't me doing my own shameless shelf promotion. Uh, I, there is a Mises Academy course of which I, uh, giving a uh, talk, you know, talking about Murray Rothbard's book that will be out uh, about the book uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, you know, I know the, the anticipation is probably killing all of you. Uh, so, you know, it should be out soon. Um, but uh, Murray Rothbard, his, his work on monetary history, a lot of people have spoken about his theory. Uh, most of the work that I do, at least is in economic history, and as an economic historian, uh, there's, you know, the work has heavily influenced me. Uh, he, sometimes Rothbard will just spend a couple pages on something. He'll talk about you know, the national banking system, and then you have Jay Cook and Salmon P. Chase setting this whole thing up. Well, I you know, wrote a paper on that. Um, then there's a, something else in the, uh, the progressive era book. He talks about John Sherman and Sherman antitrust. Well, I you know, recently wrote a paper, wrote a paper on that. My dissertation was on business cycles, um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, basically picking the threads of sometimes what Rothbard would speak about in a couple pages, wrote a paper on the panic of 1873, another paper on the 1920 to 21 depression. Uh, my dissertation was uh, heavily influenced by Rothbard. Um, and uh, he's someone that it's, it's, it's his, his whole system of thought, I can't say that there's anyone who I'm more indebted to and who I always go back to first. Some, you know, I always am trying to either build on what he's saying, uh, you know, reinforce what he's saying, strengthen what he's saying. But, you know, from the from the very beginning, I've always been a Rothbardian and uh, I'll never turned back. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nicole Papacostas, and I'm very thankful to be here with you guys today. Um, as always, a great experience to be part of any of the Mises events. Um, my story, is, for me, is actually kind of like very funny. Um, I grew up in Colombia, the country, um, and when I was taking there my economic classes, I was always like, oh my God, I hate this. You know, it's a country that, um, when it comes to politics, is very corrupt and stuff like that. So since I was a little girl, I always hate government. I'm like, oh, why? Why we have to deal with people like that? Why they promise to you many things, and then when they get up there, everything changed, right? So I was always pretty much with that mentality, and pretty much in my family, my dad, my mom, they were pretty much that kind of way as well when it comes to government. So then I moved back to New York, and I was trying to get back to school and all of that. Uh, it didn't work with my job and stuff like that, but I got the opportunity to move to Houston, Texas, which I love. It's a beautiful state, but, you know, I can be free there, which is great. So um, I was taking my new um, economic classes there, and my professor was an Austrian economic professor. And um, I didn't know anything about Austrian economics. 
it was very new for me. So um, his classes for me was always so amazing. I'm like, I'm a good student, but sometimes, you know, when it comes to economics, I was like, oh, why? I'm like, but then when I took his classes, I was like, oh my God, can I take these classes like every day? <laughs> and then I was doing really good and he was like super surprising because a lot of the students that were in the classroom, they didn't enjoy the class as much as I did. So one day he called me side of his desk and he's like, hey, Nicole, I know that you've been enjoying this a lot. Have you ever heard of Austrian economics? And I'm like, eh, no, mm, no, I'm like, no. So he goes, well, and have you heard of Mises Institute? And I'm like, no. So he goes, okay, so every summer um, we have some things called Mises Institute and they have a Mises University, which is a whole week um, where they give scholarships to a lot of students from around the world to come and start in economics and you know, learn more about the Austrian economics. It's a very a great um, time, you should come. And I'm like, what do I need to do? Like, that was my first question. I'm like, what do I need to do? And he's like, don't worry. I walk you through um, the scholarship and we can help you to get there. Um, the following year, I got a scholarship and I was super excited, but at the same time, super nervous because I'm like, my God, I, you know, I've been reading and I'm like, I want to be surrounded by so many amazing people. They probably want to start asking me a lot of questions and I want to be like, oh, I'm very new to all of this. So I was very afraid at the beginning. But then I got there and I met amazing people. A lot of the people that are here, some of the professors and everything. And it was just like, I feel like if I find a home, like I found that home that was missing for so long. I found the answers to so many questions I always had in my mind. And I always thought like, okay, so I'm the only one that thinks like that. Am I the wrong one? I'm like the... The one that people want to be like, oh, no, you are right, you are wrong, sorry. So um, that week for me, it was amazing. I learned a lot. Um, I, well, I had the opportunity to build uh, great relationships with a lot of the amazing people that are on this table right now. I remember coming to all of them and saying like, hey, uh, what book should I read? Like, recommend me something. What, what part do I need to like, keep going? Like, I really want to learn more about this. I will go to the professors and do the same question. Bob, he's pretty much like my mentor. So thank you so much for everything, all your support and all everything, all your advices and everything you have given to me uh, for this year. And I remember the week before I was going to miss you, no, like two weeks before, I got an email with all the studies, all the material that you need to do before you get to Mrs. Institute for Mrs. U. And I was like, oh my God, all these books. And I was like, wow, okay, I need to just focus and start studying and reading. So I, I, you know, at least I know something when I get there. It was very particular that when I opened all the books, the first one that I opened was What Government Has Done to Our Money. Just the title of the book, I was like, oh, yes, what they have done to our money. <laughs> I'm like, that's true. I'm like, oh, yeah, well, okay, this is very particular. So I started reading it, and, you know, of course, it's one of Rodolfo's uh, um, books. So I was like, oh, wow. I'm like, I start finding all these answers to a lot of the questions and to a lot of the things I never thought about it. And then I was like, wow, this is amazing. Then my second book was Anatomy of the State. Um, the title for me, I was like, wow, you know, like how you call anatomy at the state? Like the titles were so fascinating that I was like, the, I need to read it too. So when I read it, I just, with those two books literally like changed my mind. And like how Dr. Um, Rumpel mentioned it today, it takes just one person for you to go and talk. Just one person for come to you and say, hey, do you want to do this? Hey, do you want to try this? hey, this is what's going on that you probably don't know. So that economics professor changed my mind when he told me, do you want to go to Mrs. Institute? And I'm like, sure. And then when I got there, they all become my family. They all you know, are great people, great mentors. And you know, we are, we are so, like I always, like when I look all of you guys, like I just look like heroes, you know, like 
people that have a strong minds, people that are here for a reason. So I just wanted to encourage all of you to just go out there and talk to one person that you want to change their life and tell them, hey, this is what's going on. We have rights, we have freedom. We, we need to take care of that. We need to make sure that government don't keep involving themselves as much as they do because we are here for a reason. So I'm just very thankful to be here and Murray definitely his books and his work keep coming up and I can't wait to read the new one. And I'm very excited to be part of this family and this community. And thank you so much for your time and thank you for being here. Okay, I just want to point out Guys, it's fine. They didn't clap for any of us. They clapped for every single one of them. <laughs> Don't be agonizing tonight in bed like, what did I do wrong? It, you, it was because he was showboating and then said thank you and bowed, basically. <laughs> Just so you know what happened. Okay. We're, we're going to kneel yes. and not take any of your questions. <laughs> okay, so now we have about 20 minutes, right, to uh, field your guys' questions. I think is, I think they want you to speak in the in the mic or wh why don't you know you say it and then we'll repeat it into the mic because they're recording that that's the reason but to speed it up and like i said please try not to give a speech just to ask you know because so to get more people's questions in yeah yeah um thank you very much so the name of the panel is future uh rothbard and um so each of y'all do plenty of reading we have your names because you're on the program who are the young writers that you are reading now your fellow associates and people that you're reading that you're just really impressed by their writing, maybe an article, and then we can actually look them up and read their stuff. Okay, so the question is, who are the, the Rothbardians today writing new path-breaking things that, that we'd like and to tell people to go check these guys out? Does anyone want to jump in while I think of my answer? <laughs> Private Governance by Edward Stringer. <laughs> Besides yourself. Yeah, or well, I know that... Uh, Patrick Newman has some very scintillating work. <laughs> he actually just took my words away. But um, there is a, a lot of the fellows for the Mises Institute that they have wrote a lot of articles that are, are very impressed. Um, you probably just can go to the website and find out. But um, I know this guy right here just finished one probably of the greatest books, probably. We'll see. We need to read it first and find out. <laughs> but um, there is a lot of information um, that maybe can be found in the website of all the fellows that have participated in, in the Mises Institute. That I know they're always writing articles and stuff like that. that maybe you can check it out. Yeah, I think there are other... There are two other places where you can get, I guess, more modern or younger uh, economists and thinkers. Um, one is Mises, Mises.org, Mises Wire, if you look. There are a whole bunch of, like, I, uh, Newman has a whole bunch of articles on there. Louis, whose last name starts with an R, and I actually don't know how to pronounce. Uh, Rone. He's young, up and com young, up and coming Austrian economist that writes a lot for Mises Institute, which is great. Also, Dr. Block, if you, I'm sure if you email him and ask for his. Uh, student CV. He does a lot of uh, co-authoring with students. I have a couple papers with him, and there are other students as well. I think he has about a hundred, and so he does it with, like with undergrad students. So the whole bunch of young economists that you can read there as well. I'll just say one name, and I'm going to annoy people if I don't. But like I'm doing a paper with GP Manish, M-A-N-I-S-H, and on um, calculation, and you know how, how does that play out vis-a-vis -vis other approaches? Other questions? Yeah. So, question for you, Bob. So, yesterday, after I was in a discussion with someone who I think would describe himself as a Hayekian, and he was saying that he was not a Rothbardian, and his specific critique was, I forget who he said wrote uh, the paper, but that they used um, kind of the structure of Mises' uh, regression theorem to uh, go towards um, Rothbard's kind of the, the end result of anarcho-capitalism, saying that if you take a security firm and his privatization of uh, government, that that would eventually lead to a government, and therefore it's circular, and uh, therefore an art capitalism can't logically exist. So I'm just curious. Okay, so 
the critic of Rothbard was saying, even if you started with an anarcho-capitalist society, it would devolve back into a state? Precisely. So what would be... Okay, so one thing is Rothbard himself dealt with that. And he, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, even if that were true, okay, so we wouldn't have a state for five years. Why not do that? <laughs> All right? And so... <laughs> So that, that's one thing. Now, I know the serious counter-objection is to say, oh, but it would be really bad in the middle. So um, I, I like Stefan Kinsella's uh, take on that stuff because sometimes people bring up the objection, oh, that's not practical or we can't get to there. And I, again, I'm putting words in his mouth. Maybe he wouldn't say it exactly this way, but he says something along as like, I'm just showing you like this is what would be like if there were a world without systematic rights violations. This is what a just world would look like. Now, you know, whether we can get there or not, that's a separate thing, but let's at least make the moral case. And because that's the thing, like, a lot of people, um, by the way, I'm not conceding that that's true, but I, I just want to say, even if it were the case, I don't see why it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it stands to reason. People should say, you know, the stuff that the state does and we call it taxation, if anybody else did that, it would be that when you take your little kid to the park and he sees some kid's bike and, oh, they're not even using that. Let me just go grab that. You should, no, you got to get permission. You can't just take somebody's stuff. And these are basic moral principles. And certainly the, you know, the 10 kids can't vote and then say, well, we get the bike if six of us think we can take it, right? So I think there is a whole role to do that. Um, and then again, as far as the empirical stuff, it's, I, I would disagree with that. And if you want to talk to me later, I can send you some you know, papers on that. Did, did you, do you want to say anything on that? Actually, there are a lot of people who have um, contributed to that debate. Uh, Randall Holcomb is one of the guys who would make the argument that we're going to have government whether we like it or not. He said it is illegitimate, so I, I would refer to him as a pessimistic anarchist. Uh, the state is bad, but we're going to have it. Um, my colleague Jeff Hummel, uh, among other people, former colleague Jeff Hummel at San Jose State, has written about that. And he basically says, okay, fine, uh, maybe we're always going to have disease, but just because we're always going to have disease, we shouldn't embrace it. He says the world has microparasites and macroparasites, and our job is to be fighting both. Okay, yeah, wait in the Walter, yeah. <laughs> Are you in the right room? Wait a minute. <laughs> There's another argument, and that is right now we have anarchy between countries. The relationship of Canada and Chile one of anarchy because there's no over government over the two. The relationship of Burundi and, uh, I don't know, uh, France is one of anarchy. So we have an empirical experiment because if this thing is correct, namely that uh, anarchy devolves into government, we should find world government. But we don't. Namely, the anarchy of countries, we have 250 countries, give or take, and we've had 250 countries for many hundreds of years which shows the stability of anarchy. Namely, look, the goal of libertarians is to have, we're not against the government, we just want seven billion of them. <laughs> <laughs> One for each. So when you ask a girl out, you can't ask her out, you have to get your foreign minister to ask her foreign minister. <laughs> but the point is that we have some stability, we have some evidence that anarchy is stable. So this would counteract the, uh, uh, the, the contract. I heard you say that on Todd Woods, and I forgot when I was in the debate. So. <laughs> yeah. In fairness, Hillary Clinton's being logically consistent because she's for one world government. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the spirit of the uh, future of, um, of uh, posture and economics, I think the three on my right, uh, two of you are writing and maybe teaching, and Ashton is thinking of applying her teaching in her, uh, in her career entrepreneur. I wonder if the other four who haven't spoken about what they're going to be doing with their lives in the future might be great to hear from. Okay, so again, just to repeat, because we're recording, um, he wants to know, like, of the people who didn't explicitly say one way or the other, are they thinking of what are they doing with their careers and is it going to involve academia? Uh, for me personally, academia is the career path. I'm in my last year of undergrad under Dr. Block at Lola. Uh, next, I'm going to go to grad school for my master's at Troy, and then I plan to go to La Universidad de Rey Juan Carlos in Spain for my PhD. So academia is uh, my career path. Um, I'm just going to be an entrepreneur. I had a business prior. Then I went back to studying, and I'm going to start again. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just going to leave the libertarian principles. She's actually going to help society. <laughs> I am also trying to help society, and trying is always the key word. 
Um, I'm also self-employed. I, I started my own business about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's actually interesting that because there is a lot of uh, Austrian insights that, that are applied. I sell a very premium, arguably wildly expensive product. And it's, it, it's interesting because like when I'm selling it to people, I do a lot of sampling. They're uh, cold pressed juices, they're vegetable juices. And when I give, sam I give samples out to people all the time and I tell them the price and then you know, they usually spit it out of disgust. <laughs> and um, despite that, it tastes very good. And, uh, and then I kind of like explain to them you know, some of the value and understanding that, that value is, is uh, ordinal and not cardinal, meaning like it's a rank and not numbers. Like I, I'm understanding that like I have to sell them on the fact to get this drink higher than the number that I'm too shy to say out loud of, of the price of the product. Um, and, and many other insights as well as the same thing, understanding decision makers from the like applying uh, kind of like incentives to the buyers that are going to make the decision on whether to add the product line in general. Uh, just really applying all the Austrian insights I have to my business. Yeah, another thing you can say is you're like, those dollars you're holding, nothing's backing them up. Just give them to me. That's <laughs> okay. Other, uh, yeah, you're right there. You, yep. Yeah. So uh, economics is the most developed branch of praxeology, but what are the other branches, and is there uh, work being done by uh, young Austrians on the other branches of praxeology? Okay, so the question is, so praxeology is the scientific study of the implications of the fact that humans act, the logic of action per se, and then Mises has always said that catalactics is, you know, economic science proper is like just a subset of that. So the question is, are there other areas within praxeology that people are working on? So one thing is, um, Walter, if you want to jump in on this also, uh, one thing, um, Rothbard in Power and Market was doing like a praxeological analysis of government interventions, like a typology of intervention. And so there I think he was trying to do that. I know there have been papers at Austrian scholars conferences. Off the top of my head, I can't remember, you know, the authors, but who are doing things like in terms of like international affairs and, you know, like a, a, an approach to international warfare from the perspective of, of praxeology. Do you guys want to say anything? Yeah, I think that sociology, anthropology are types of science, social science in the same way that economics is. However, as a practical matter, there's a strong, I'll just call it a bias, uh, huge left-wing influence among those disciplines. So I know a guy who does work in that area, and he says he, he won't even mention his, the, the fact that he likes markets because it's like they get daggers in his eyes. Uh, so it is kind of unfortunate, but economics, I say, is one of the few disciplines which is relatively open to different viewpoints. And I would say the same is not true in sociology and anthropology and other disciplines. And, and I won't go into much detail, but for the past month or so, I've been working on some, like, applying praxeology to political economy. I guess that's all I'll really say about it. But okay. everyone got to plug something, so I'm kind of glad you asked that question. I'm working on something. <laughs> okay, Walter. Uh, another field is uh, political science, and the public choice people are sort of doing that. I just came out with a book with Tom DiLorenzo where we whip up public choice as best we can because we think we're, they're going in the wrong direction, but we would acknowledge that it's a, a, branch, of, a branch of praxeology that's not even on. Yeah, he asked for young scholars, though, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, if any, role do you see in the future of the Austrian tradition for cryptocurrency and blockchain technology? Okay, so it was on uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. Um, so there, the, the big thing, if you don't know, there's a there was some concern when, when Bitcoin first hit on the scene, and a lot of Austrians are saying, doesn't this violate the regression theorem? Okay, so if you go to YouTube and say Robert Murphy Bitcoin conference, I'll explain the pros and cons. And I do such a great job of where I don't take a personal stand, right? So I like, no, you can be infuriated, but you can't really pin me down because you don't know what my own position is. But I explain what the issue is. So there, uh, I think Bitcoin's a, a, a cool, it's definitely a neat thing. I think a lot of monetary economists would not have thought it was possible that it did what it did. And so there, there, there's that element involved, but it's a, so I would just point people to that and um, understanding bitcoin.us, I have some other stuff there. Do you guys wanna chime in on Bitcoin? Yeah, um, yeah at least with the, the Bitcoin, uh, this is yeah, something more or less what uh, Dr. Murphy has been saying. 
the idea that, uh, you know, it's violate the regression theorem, et cetera. I mean, I think there's a definitely potential in there. I think sometimes people are, I guess, too bullish on Bitcoin sometimes. Um, and not so much that the fact that it's a cryptocurrency, but at least something, at least just to tie in sort of uh, with Rothbard, some of a panel on Rothbard. Um, Rothbard did always, whenever he talk, talked about returning to a free market in money, he was always concerned about privatizing the dollar. Basically, because his main argument this is something a lot of writers hold is that uh, there's there's network costs. So people aren't going to switch to a new currency, basically, unless it gets really bad. So his goal was always trying to uh, the actual dollar currency, that that unit of account, trying to return it, you know, make that, you know, either either a redefining it uh, with the gold standard or some, something of that nature. So I do think really, you know, that it will continue to grow. The Bitcoin, I think it obviously depends on what governments are going to do about it, whether or not they'll allow it. I think whether it will supplant the dollar or actual, you know, major currencies, I don't think that will happen unless the dollar absolutely just like tanks, like it becomes so bad. Most people stubbornly cling to a currency until the bitter end. I'll also add that whether or not the specific currency, Bitcoin, is successful technology from it is already being used by JP Morgan as we speak. So the CEO has been criticizing that specific currency and that's fine. He, he can, maybe he's right, but he's investing heavily in Ethereum, which is a competitor to Bitcoin. So I think that Bitcoin could be maybe like uh, Netscape or AOL. They don't really exist anymore, but those companies changed um, the internet in the 1990s, and I would say the same thing with any of these other uh, blockchain technology that are being used by mainstream financial uh, banks right now. One last thing on that is even putting aside the currency aspect, that you know the electronic currency, the digital currency, in terms of private law enforcement and things like decentralization. There's a lot of people who are looking, saying the currency stuff. I don't even care about that. Just like we don't need some third party arbitrator to be in charge like you know there's sort of like self enforcing contracts so there's there's a whole area of this this intellectual innovation of stuff that's possible now and i know if you don't really know what that is it's like i'm just saying gobbledygook but if you go look at that so it's conceivable 100 200 years from now like the the cryptocurrency part is just the first application of this broader innovation and what people can do okay we got time for one more question no pressure but i hope it's awesome yeah questions for anyone but what's one of your favorite short essays by Rothbard and like what's a profound statement that he made that really rung home to you like an essay that was kind of not well known in his works within the Austrian community okay so the question was um, any, any like lesser known hit, hit from Rothbard like the side B of the yeah, yeah. so um, well, first, statement-wise, I, I know you said last month, but anatomy, when he explained why democracy isn't, we, like, the, why the people in charge aren't actually the government, I thought that was brilliant because, as you said, you know, if that were true, then technically the Jews committed suicide, which is absurd. Um, Lesser known works, I just finished going through Foundations of Modern Ec uh, Austrian Economics, uh, edited by Richard Dolan, I think, uh, came out from the South Rolston Conference, and Rothbard has good essays on uh, methodology in there. And I think he also, or maybe, he might have also gone into the market process concept, but his, uh, in that essay, I think it's really important because he kind of lays out point by point how we get from the action axiom to other things. And I think that's something that would be very beneficial to read to kind of see how we, you know, we kind of, okay, we know that, you know, minimum wage necessarily causes more unemployment than otherwise. And we know it's apodictic, but we don't know necessarily the chain. And so in, in that book, Foundations for Modern Austrian Economics, Rothbard kind of goes through the action axiom and what can be deduced from it. And it kind of puts out at least part of the chain that I think is really beneficial to read. Um, for me, just one, it, it, I think it was in Making Economic Sense where he had a thing on the Iraq, the first, I think it was the first Iraq invasion. And at the time, I was kind of coming from like a Rush Limbaugh background. And so like to me, that just like... Because I loved him so much in economics, and this was blowing my mind, and it, you know, that really changed, you know, a, a different part. So, in terms of things that you might not have expected, I'm saying that if you go read it, and it's eerie how much like you could take that and apply it to the second Gulf War too, and it's like a lot of the same names even, so it's freaky. What's the same, what's the title it has if you go to making economic sense and look at the um, chapter table of contents, it has Gulf War in it. I think I don't remember the title. 
Uh, I'll say uh, two of them. One is one that Bob touched on earlier. It has the most unappealing title in the world, but to show you how awesome Rothbard is, I actually ventured to read it, and it's Towards a Reconstruction of Utility and Welfare Economics. Um, <laughs> it sounds horrible, but it's actually awesome. Uh, the first, like, it's amazing. The first, you know, I don't remember, 20 or 30 pages, it's like real technical, like, definitions and, like, refutations of other things, and then just, like, within one page, it's just like, bam, and there's this implication of it of, you know, you can't, compare people's utility and therefore it's like not a justification for a lot of state action but just like how systematic and like it's like so scholarly in the beginning and then it, it's still scholarly at the end but it just he kind of comes with this like incredible like realistic takeaway that like you know government you can't really say that government makes people's lives better off because you just can't compare how happy the person that was taxed compared to the, the recipient. Uh, and the other one is Big Government Libertarians. I actually read it on the plane here um, from Tho Bishop's recommendation. And it was just amazing how insightful he is. I mean, he was dissecting a lot of the issues with people that can be classified as left libertarians. But the, my favorite part of it was him uh, condemning Bill Weld and calling him, like, not a real libertarian. Uh, and it was... <laughs> it was... <laughs> It was perfect. I mean, he, he literally criticized everything that is applicable to the way he spoke in the campaign. And it's just, it's really just, if you want to just be wowed at how insightful he was, read Big Government Libertarians. A quick one? Yeah. Uh, I guess there's uh, six not so well known essays that have influenced me a lot, and there are chapters 9 through 15 in the book. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's all I'll say on that. Okay, so I think we're out of time. Maybe some of these people will be sticking around if you want to ask private questions. Thanks, everybody.